It's 1 p.m. in New York, 8 p.m. in the Middle East. Good evening from the Jaffa port. Tonight on the lineup, we'll take a closer look at the ongoing trial of Sergeant Elor Azaria, the IDF soldier who shot and killed a subdued Palestinian assailant in Hebron last March in a case that has split Israeli society. Dubbed the so-called Hebron shooter trial, our senior defense correspondent Shai Benary spent the day in Jaffa's military court. The trial of Alor Azaria saw testimony given by several witnesses Wednesday, including two volunteers with the organization known as B'Tselem, a group which seeks to document human rights violations in the West Bank. One of these volunteers shot the video in which Azaria can be seen shooting a Palestinian assailant in the head as he lay on the ground. In the cross-examination of the B'Tselem volunteer, a defense attorney raised questions over the video he had filmed claiming that shouting, heard clearly in other videos shot by people on the scene, could not be heard in his video. For some reason, in none of the videos filmed by Betselem, can the words, watch out, he's got an explosive, or similar words, be heard. The defense was referring to segments like this one from a different video. The terrorist is still alive, the dog. Don't let him get up, a man can be heard saying. Another adds, he probably has an explosive on him. Watch out, nobody touches him until a bomb squad arrives. But the defense attorney's statement that no shouting could be heard in the B'Tselem video triggered an objection from the prosecutor, who stated that the video shot by the B'Tselem volunteer was shot from further away, and that some of the shouting could be heard, despite the distance. Indeed, when we examined the B'Tselem video ourselves, the same shouting, at the same point in time, warning of the explosive is discernible, though at a lower volume contradicting the claims of Azaria's defense. Here it is again in the alternative video, shot closer to the shouting. And here it is again in the B'Tselem video. The defense pointed out that the memory card containing the original footage was handed to several different people before reaching the hands of military police investigators. A police forensics expert who also testified Wednesday admitted he was unaware of this fact, but added he was certain the video evidence had not been tampered with, as any intervention would have left telltale signs. The filming of the videos was biased, and we've proven that. They filmed when it was convenient and didn't film when it was inconvenient. The B'Tselem video contains two minutes and 20 seconds of unbroken one-shot footage, including the build-up and aftermath of the incident. Shai Benary now uh, joined us in the studio. Shai, you spent the entire morning in the trial. What is the defense's strategy? What were they trying to prove today? Right. Really, the, the main point I would say that they were trying to make today, at least, was that the videos shot by this B'Tselem group are biased or unobjective in some way, noting, for example, that there were several different videos shot by at least two uh, B'Tselem volunteers, uh, raising the question why some moments were filmed, why some moments were not filmed. But let's just uh, stay a for a moment on this main video, which we saw several times in, in, the, in the piece, which really documents the actual moment of the shooting. There's only one video that actually documents that moment. This main video, we'll just note, is one continuous shot. The whole video stretches uh, two minutes and 20 seconds, but you get a minute and 45 seconds before the actual shooting. So you get the entire buildup. You get the the, and the, the general soldiers atmosphere. Now right. we're, we're seeing the visuals once again that right. you That's showed in your shooting. report. This is the moment of the shooting. This is the video that mm. many are already familiar with. But there was also new footage that arrived from the scene presented today as evidence. Right. There was some more uh, video evidence. Uh, there's been a few different videos shown at court already. One t shot today was shot by a different uh, B'Tselem volunteer showing Elora Zaria following the shooting. Uh, smiling and shaking hands with a man known as Bar Baruch Marzel. Marzel is a well-known right-wing extremist here in Israel, is known for his very radical views and uh, basically a hatred towards uh, Arabs. In general, Azaria is all seen smiling also and shaking hands with a man also known as Ofer Ohana, a different man. Uh, he is actually the same paramedic who can be seen, we, sh we saw last week, kicking a knife closer to the body of that Palestinian assailant, perhaps in an attempt to sort of uh, uh, tamper with the evidence here and make it as if the Palestinian assailant was closer to that knife than he actually was. Which is, a, which is part of uh, the defense uh, strategy today. Mm -hmm. Now, the video that we were just uh, uh, seeing, 
In your report, you mentioned the fact that there was no sound, and the defense is trying to say, uh, the prosecutor is trying to say that, uh, in fact, this could be um, maybe questionable material if you can't hear uh, right. the actual sounds. Basically, the impression I, I was getting from the defense team was that the they were trying to make the impression that perhaps the evidence was tampered with. They, did, they denied this sort of charge later on. They say we're, that's not what we're trying to say. But they did, for in several different moments during the trial today, say this video is not credible, this video has no sound on it, even, even though there are certainly cer uh, very discernible levels of sound. And you can even hear those same shouts, which they said could not be uh, heard on the video, which you can hear on other videos, supposedly uh, suggesting that these shouts have been removed in some, in some way. And we'll just uh, note again, remind everyone everybody that a police forensics expert who was also a witness today he was part of the initial investigation also noted stated for the record that no uh, evidence had been tampered with no vis vi visual evidence including this video which is of course the critical really so piece we're seeing of evidence. this video as we speak can you walk us through what you can see in the video for those who missed it this is the one and a half uh, 140 uh, minute video that this, shows the atmosphere or is this the new this visuals? is the new video where you can see uh, Baruch Marzal that's the guy with his back to camera you can see him now Okay. He was shaking hands with Alora Azaria. Alora Azaria can actually be, be seen smiling. Which just has been mentioned previously, mm -hmm. but it was uh, right. uh, presented as evidence only today. Indeed, this emerged before the trial even began. Uh, the video emerged with the blurring on the face of Alora Azaria. Today, it emerges in court uh, without blurring. You can basically see there uh, that he's smiling and shaking hands with a well-known right-wing extremist. Whether this uh, has anything to do with his motive, that it's too, that's not for us to say, let's say. But it has been presented in a court of uh, military law, basically, with this presented as a piece of evidence in the general context of the trial. Shai, thank you very much. Of sure. course, you'll continue to update us on this case. No problem. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is due to land in Israel this evening in the coming hours following a three-day visit to Russia, which marks 25 years to the renewal of diplomatic ties between Jerusalem and Moscow. The two leaders, who have now met four times this past year alone, called for stronger economic and military ties, as Israel hopes to secure its continued military coordination with Russia. Owen Alterman has the report. On the surface, Prime Minister Netanyahu's two-day visit to Moscow couldn't have gone any better. The Russians arranged a raft of diplomatic gestures that kept the Kremlin doors wide open to the Israeli leader. We see great importance in our relations with Israel, not only because Israel plays an important role and it's one of our most important countries in the Middle East, but also because of the historic relations between the countries. The official reason for the visit, to mark 25 years since the renewal of relations between the two countries. On the practical level, a number of economic agreements were signed in a private meeting the two leaders had on Tuesday. But for Netanyahu, this was also a practical visit, since he and Putin discussed military coordination, mainly in Syria. The Israeli premier was also a little more forthcoming than usual. Yesterday I said that we are challenged by barbarian tribes who try to destroy our culture and our countries. We understand it, and Russia understands it. In an answer to a question at a meeting with the Russian Jewish community, he implied Israel was in fact operating in Syria, reminding everyone in the room that despite the ongoing scandal, he is still very much Mr. Security. And joining us now is former member of the Israeli parliament for Yeshatid party, Rabbi Dov Lipman. Good evening. Good evening, Michal. How are you? I'm uh, well, thank you. So is Netanyahu returning to the eye of the storm? There's no doubt that uh, if I was the prime minister at the moment, I'd rather stay in Moscow and have all of the wonderful ceremonies that are going on there. It's a mess. But there have been many controversial stories surrounding Netanyahu. We seem to have missed, uh, we seem to have some technical uh, issues. Hopefully we'll be back with uh, the rabbi just in a few moments. He's back with us, Rabbi Dov Lipman. We were just caught off. You've been a, a vocal critic of Netanyahu in the past. What's your reaction on the possible fraud case? There's no doubt that there's a string of uh, cases that keep coming up. And I don't want to say each case should be judged individually, but at a certain point, I, I, I wonder when voters will say, OK, maybe we need somebody who can focus exclusively uh, on running the country. And I, it bothered me to hear the prime minister say in Russia that these are people who are out to get him. Uh, once in a while, 
Well, you can say that, but to say this time after time, uh, again, if he's ex if he's let off the hook each time, that's fine. But to suggest that there's some kind of a concerted effort to top him with all these scandals, I don't think that can be accurate. But I don't Rabbi think that's Lieberman, fair to say. There have been many and controversial point, stories. Want... Sorry for cutting up. There have been many controversial stories surrounding well, Netanyahu. I think we're being cut off once again. We'll uh, move on. We, we're having uh, uh, reports from other Israeli media outlets tonight saying that opposition leader Isaac Herzog has been requestioned by police over fundraising. This as uh, Netanyahu returns this evening from Moscow and may face uh, new fraud allegations. Moving on ahead of Euro 2016 tournament, France launches a terror alert app that would inform users of security threats and provide information on how to stay safe. Now, France has been on high alert ever since the Paris attacks. The French Interior Ministry released the app today ahead of the UEFA, UEFA Euro football tournament, which kicks off on Friday outside of Paris. Meanwhile, French police have been holding a drill planning for the worst scenario. Scenario, Gabby Weiniger has the story. Screaming and explosions in Lyon's Belcour Square. The scenario, a kamikaze has actioned his explosive belt while waiting in line. Two more terrorists are on site and start shooting the crowd, causing panic and wreaking havoc. But this, happily, is not the real thing, although it's anyone's current nightmare. It's a security drill to test the efficiency of France's rapid reaction forces ahead of the Euro 2016 football championships. In only two days' time, this square will be flooded with 25,000 football supporters. After the explosion, the raid forces intervened immediately to secure the area. While waiting for the firefighters and the first responders, the men of the raid started to evacuate the wounded laying on the ground. 450 members of the security forces, as well as first responders, took part in this simulation. It's the last drill before Euro 2016 kicks off. Other government initiatives for the tournament, a smartphone app, which was first unveiled in Lyon. It will allow people to remain alert in case of immediate danger or in case of a terror attack. The app also gives advice about the kind of behavior one should have and instructions on what to do according to the type and nature of the alert. We'll be speaking to Christian Millard, our uh, senior political analyst in Paris, in just a few minutes. But first, some more world news. A second day of bloodshed in Turkey as a car bomb targeted a police station in the mainly Kurdish southeast, killing three people and wounding at least 30 others. The attack, which President Erdogan blames on the PKK militants, took place one day after a bomb in the heart of Istanbul killed 11 people. Anna Ehrenheim has more. Just one day after a car bomb killed 11 people in the Turkish city of Istanbul, another explosion ripped through a Turkish city, killing at least three people, two policemen and a civilian and wounded another 30. The explosion, which hit the southeastern town of Midyat, sent a thick black plume of smoke into the sky and completely destroyed the facade of a five-story building. Midyat is in the province of Mardin, which borders Syria and whose population is mainly Kurdish and is where the Kurdistan Workers' Party, or PKK, has waged a deadly three-decade insurgency. The PKK is considered a terror organization by Ankara, as well as the European Union and the United States. While no group has yet to claim the two latest attacks, PKK militants have carried out similar attacks targeting security forces in recent months, including in the capital of Ankara. The bombings are the latest in a string of attacks that have rattled citizens and damaged the country's tourism industry. At least seven attacks have struck Turkey since July 2015, and while most of them were carried out by Kurdish militants, the Islamic State is believed to be behind at least two of them. Turkey faces multiple security threats and has been on high alert following a string of deadly attacks since last year, including an attack in Ankara in October which killed 103 people. I-24 News contributor Laura Patel joins us now from Istanbul. Laura, good evening. Uh, Turkish soldiers have been the target of these recent attacks. This is the second day of unclaimed attacks. How is the government reacting? 
Well, in both of these cases, government officials and ministers have now blamed the PKK, the Kurdistan Workers' Party. That's the Kurdish militant group that has been battling the state ever since the 80s, on and off. Um, and last July, the ceasefire between the two sides collapsed once again, plunging the mainly Kurdish southeast of the country back into violence. But increasingly, we're seeing these attacks spilling over into the west of Turkey, cities like Istanbul and Ankara as well. And is the crackdown on the PKK, the outlawed uh, Kurdistan Workers' Party, ongoing? Yeah, operations kind of uh, happening in a rolling manner across cities in the southeast. So near this latest attack in Midyat, um, operations recently ended in a nearby town called Nasebin, where 430 alleged PKK members were killed by the government during that operation. Curfews are in place elsewhere in the southeast as Kurdish security forces and police try to clear out these fighters. And Laura, um, are we seeing increased military presence within uh, uh, Turkey and uh, around the main cities considering the, the recent escalation and, and multiple attacks? Yeah, we are. We are seeing an increased um, security presence. It's also having an effect on the politics as well. After this latest attack, uh, the, the prime minister said that uh, Turkey, that the EU, sorry, Turkey's ally, the EU, should not apply pressure on Turkey to alter its terrorism laws, as it has been doing as part of a crucial deal between Turkey and the EU to stem the flow of refugees. So, as you can see, it's going to have all sorts of knock-on effects in other arenas as well. Absolutely. And how is Erdogan dealing with the recent verbal attack on him from neighboring Syria, with all that's happening, another front that he has to deal with? He hasn't responded to that one yet. I mean, there's been a back and forth between those two leaders for some time now. In the past, Erdogan has compared President Assad to a murderer. I mean, he says that he has murdered hundreds of thousands of people. Many others would agree. I think it's to say, safe to say that one is not a happy friendship. Laura Patel, thank you for joining us from Istanbul. And we're going to go back to our Euro 2016 story. We're now joined by our senior political analyst in Paris, Christian Malal. Thank you for being with us. Good evening. Good evening, Michal. Christian, so uh, uh, the French have uh, 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 they've released an app today. How are Parisians reacting to this? Well, the, 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 the Parisians are ready for anything because every day we have the president of the prime minister keeping telling the French or reminding them that there is no, no zero risk concerning terrorist attack. We are in a state of emergency, so the French are ready to have any moment when we live with that. As in Israel, you live also with the threat of terrorist attacks all the time. So during this period, we know that the degree, the level of uh, danger of terrorist attack is very high. And even today, which was very strange, uh, the new Republican president of the Parisian Regional Council, Madame Valérie Pécresse, uh, said, oh my God, I am not going to send my sons to the fan zones to attend the games, to see the game on huge screen. No way, because it's too dangerous. So if you speak this way to the French public opinion, it's clear that uh, you are not going to push or incitate the French people to go to fan zones or to the stadiums. Can we expect the first games to be cancelled due to the high security risk? No. Uh, we will only cancel the first games, of course, if we have a terrorist attack on this, for sure. But uh, President Holland said that uh, he was uh, really tightening the security in the country. Uh, we have globally 100,000 persons uh, really dealing with the security over 10 big cities where we have 10 fan zones, 10 stadiums. Uh, and definitely we have to be careful about the fan zones because uh, from the smaller to the bigger ones, uh, we can, they can host from 10,000 people to 92,000 people. Indeed, and people Christian, are not many, allowed to get... Sorry to cut you off, but many French officials and international leaders are calling to cancel or postpone the games because of these high security uh, alerts and because of the uh, a very large number of people and fans that will attend. Is this a risk that uh, France should be taking right now? No. You know, we, we know we are under a threat, no doubt about that. But the French president and the prime minister say all the times that if we decide to cancel everything before we officially starting the Eurofoot, uh, it will be a point scored by the terrorists. 
So there is no way we are going to cancel anything. But all the, the impact on all this with this threat and the declarations made here and there is that uh, we have a lot of cancellations in hotels or trips of people who are so scared about what happens. And plus that, you have to, to add the strikes, the floods, which are ending. But still, it's the confused, messy situation uh, doesn't uh, push the people uh, to come. But the French government, they've made a very big deal releasing this app today. Are people taking this terror app seriously? And also, this will notify uh, users once a, a terror uh, uh, event or some incident takes place, God forbid. But once that no. happens, how useful is an app like it, this? Well, it, it, it is uh, alert app. Uh, started this morning. It's very brand new. And definitely the French people are going to focus on that wherever they go because they know the stretch is everywhere. It can be in Paris during the Euro Games, but it can be also in some very sensitive areas like Marseille and Nice in the southern part of France where we have a lot of Muslim fundamentalist networks in the area, people who are scrutinized, watched very clearly, closely by the police. And I want to remind you, we are going to have 42,000 policemen, 30,000 civil guards, 10,000 military. I was alluding to 100,000 people tightening the security of the country. So during one month, it would be very tense here, definitely. And at the same time, uh, the government is dealing with the labor strikes. Could these in any way affect the games? Yes, the labor strikes is a problem because the government doesn't succeed in dealing with this, I'm sorry to say that, crazy, stupid CGT, which is the communist Marxist unions. These people only are able to say no to everything. And President Hollande keeps telling them we have to know how to stop a strike. But these people don't care. They only say no. This is the only no they know in their dictionary. Christian Malar, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Now, in the latest on sports, Maria Sharapova has been banned for two years by the International Tennis Federation after failing a drug test. The heart disease drug meldonium, which not to the 29-year-old says she has been taking since 2006 for health issues, became a banned substance on January 1, 2016. The five-time Grand Slam winner says she plans to appeal. Now, the Islamic State group is widely known for their tech-savvy abilities embedding fear using social media. But the group is getting a taste of their own medicine these days, well, in the form of porn. Islamic State accounts and those who support the group are being spammed. And this next report by I-24 News elaborates on this new phenomenon. There's something new trending on Twitter. Islamic State accounts and those who support the group are being spammed, followed by thousands of graphic porn accounts. This trend was first identified by J.M. Berger, an expert on online extremism and who used an analytical tool to help identify and locate Twitter accounts which support or promote the Islamic State. Well, I noticed, uh, periodically noticed that there had been some uh, different kinds of porn bot activity in, in these ISIS networks. And it's really been happening for a couple of years off and on. There'll be a, you know, a sort of wave of, of these trolling attacks and then they'll sort of die off. Um, so I had already been looking at some of these bots that I'd seen in English and Arabic speaking networks, and uh, a colleague referred me to the ones that uh, I tweeted about, which is a French, French speaking uh, ISIS supporter network that's been targeted by them. At the group's peak, they had strategically recruited young men and women from all over the world, using social accounts like Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram to brainwash their recruits. According to Berger's work, Twitter accounts belonging to IS supporters have had a considerably higher amount of followers than the average Twitter user, with an average of about 1,000 followers each. Over the past year, social networks seem to have realized the power of their reach and have been working tirelessly to suspend accounts affiliated with the Islamic State. You know, it happens in, in waves. So there will be a wave of reporting, um, you know, accounts like Anonymous or GhostSec, 
uh, online activists of various kinds will go in and, and, you know, report a lot of accounts at once, and so we'll see a lot of them disappear. A lot of these users don't come back to Twitter. So, you know, if you want to recruit people, you have to be on one of the big social media platforms. But even even at their peak now, uh, they're still far lower than, than what they were before. These spamming accounts, known as porn bots, have taken the fight to a new level, inundating IS accounts with as many as 4,000 followers. And while these accounts almost never tweet, some victims have locked their accounts to new followers as they look for a solution to the problem. Well, I think it uh, certainly it'll discourage some of them. This particular kind of attack, you know, it's it's going to have a certain amount of effectiveness. It depends on how long the people who are carrying out the attack want to continue doing it. Most IS fighters and supporters have grown up with the internet, living and socializing online. The role of the internet is a known driving force behind radicalization, giving extremists the ability to amplify their message in a way that was never seen before. But the internet also has some very creative ways to counter extremism, especially extremists belonging to the Islamic State. Pornography. And we just received some breaking news from London as police have carried out a controlled explosion outside of the Israeli embassy. This is taking place in London. And of course, we will update you with more information once it becomes available. Now for a look at some of the other stories defining the day around the world. Dozens of people were wounded in Papua New Guinea after police opened fire on a student demonstration in the capital. Riots erupted across the country to protest corruption allegations in the government. There are conflicting reports about the number of casualties. More than 16,000 items that belonged to Auschwitz victims were recovered after they were found in boxes at the Polish Academy of Sciences. Among the items, thermometers, jewelry, tobacco pipes and buttons. The find was described by the Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum as a moving personal testimony of the victims. A floating school in Makoko, Nigeria, which became a beacon of hope for the nearly 100,000 Nigerians who live there, was destroyed in a storm, despite being built to specifically withstand the storms and floods that are common in the four-month-long rainy season. A Russian aviation company unveiled its new medium-range passenger plane, MS-21. Company officials said the new plane is not only lighter and stronger, but will also exceed customers' comfort expectations. Hundreds of Muhammad Ali fans are spending hours standing in line for tickets to a memorial service for the late boxer in his hometown, Louisville, Kentucky. Short break and we'll be back in just two minutes.